Hello, and welcome to this midweek message from Park Road Church, Rushton. I'm Chris, and I'm filling in for Mark this week as he takes a well-earned rest. Do you ever feel as though the work you do sometimes seems insignificant? Do you ever find yourself struggling through the daily grind of life? Do you ever feel that what you do could be more joyful and more impactful? I'm sure we've all been there. Well, as God's word is timeless, It is also timely, and I hope that together we can find help from God's word today. Colossians 2, 23 and 24 says, Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord, and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive your inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. This can be hard, but there is a way in which whatever work we we do, we can find joy. This could be paid work. It might be running a home. It could be taking care of your children or your grandchildren. It could be weeding the garden, making a meal, doing that dull admin task, and loads and loads of other things besides. But what this can, can get really hard is that we have a tendency to compare ourselves to others. Do you ever find yourself giving up or losing heart on things because you see or hear of someone else doing great things? We sometimes measure ourselves by the attainments or the goals of others. But just because we hear of something great doesn't mean that God thinks it's great. In recent times, our society has become more aware of the importance of certain roles in our world. Carers, bin men, shop assistants, NHS workers, the list goes on and on. Society has grown a deeper appreciation of these roles, which are far from the highest paid. But in God's economy, no job is inconsequential, and all work that is for him has significant value. In the parable of the talents, we are assured that we are responsible for what God has provided us. No more, no less. In this parable, Jesus tells us of a man who appears to have a significant household to manage with servants and wealth. This man goes away for a while and entrusts varying amounts of money and therefore responsibility on three of his servants. He gives five talents to one, two talents to another and one to a third. Those with five and two talents both went off immediately, we're told, and traded with what they had and doubled what they had been given. But the servant with one talent, fearing his master, played it safe and hid his talent in the ground. Now, after a very long time, the master returned and was delighted when the servants who had been given five and two talents respectively reported that they had doubled their master's investment. The master says, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. When the master heard that the servant with one talent had buried it and made no effort to increase the investment entrusted to him, the master was furious, saying, you wicked and slothful servant. Of course, the master in this parable is Jesus. And both this parable and the passage in Colossians I read earlier speak to the need to work heartily for the Lord. We can often become disheartened because we think the work we've been entrusted with is not as great as that being achieved by others. But these passages teach us that we are to be faithful to whatever God has entrusted us with. So shall we complain about how little we feel we've been entrusted with? Or shall we consider that all our work is for the Lord and see the great joy and privilege it is to labour for the creator of all things? When Paul, writing to the churches he did in Colossae, instructs them to work heartily as for the Lord, he is also saying that it doesn't matter what a task at hand is. We are to find joy because we are doing it for Jesus. Think about the widow who gave all that she had, just two copper coins. It was all she had to live on, yet she gave it all as an offering to God. There were others there that day who had given more in financial terms, but Jesus, taking his disciples to one side, tells them that no one had given more than the widow that day. What about the woman who anointed Jesus with uh, oil? You can read about that event in Mark 14. 
This ointment was incredibly expensive. Jesus' disciples were indignant at what they thought was a waste of a valuable commodity which could have been sold to feed the poor. But Jesus tells them that this woman has done a beautiful thing for him. She did what she could with what she had for the Lord. There's also the example of a chap called Onesiphorus. I really hope I'm pronouncing his name correctly. He's a chap who helped Paul when many had turned away from him. You can read about him in 2 Timothy chapter 1. You see, sometimes people were ashamed of Paul, perhaps because of the message he was preaching, but also because of the multiple arrests, the beatings, the imprisonments. But Onesiphorus helped him practically using what he had to help Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus. So you have a servant with five or two talents. You have the widow, the woman with expensive ointment, Onesiphorus. They all used what they had for the Lord. I think one of the rarest traits found in this world today is faithfulness. Faithfulness is being a husband, a wife, a Sunday school teacher, a deacon, a mother, a father, a friend. Being faithful means being committed to the task in hand and to the person we are doing for. It is not about seeking the praise of man and our own self-glory. Instead, working heartily for God and being faithful to that aim is seeking to glorify God. This can be tough. I find it tough. It can be so edifying to receive a word of encouragement or thank you for a job well done. And of course, we should be saying thank you to those who have worked hard. But when that becomes the motivation for our actions, where we seek the approval and attention of man, we will fall into the pattern of this world and our own sinful natures. But as Christians, we are given a new nature that seeks to glorify God and not ourselves. This new nature, this new creation changes our desires. We seek to desire the glory of God because our desires are changed to match the desires of God. And God is most concerned about his glory above all other things. That's not to say we're not going to struggle. We can find a task we have to undertake to be trivial and not on par with the great task we hear and see others do. But all things can be done for the glory of God. Did you know you can sleep to the glory of God? Well, you can. You can also sleep because we're being lazy. But you can sleep to the glory of God. Let me tell you how. If you are going to be giving your all in the endeavours God has entrusted to you, you are going to need rest. And like Jesus, when he was on earth, you're going to need to sleep. And when you do, you will awake refreshed to glorify God through your work all over again. You get another day to work heartily as to the Lord. That's a great privilege and it's amazing grace. You see, we deserve to be under the just and perfect wrath of God for our sins against him. We don't deserve life. We deserve death. We are the wretches that great hymn sings of. But through Christ, he forgives us. And we get the great privilege and pleasure in serving him in all that we do. It doesn't matter what that work is. If you are the CEO of a large company, you can lead your organisation heartily as to the Lord. If you are a bin man, you can collect and dispose of waste heartily as to the Lord. If you are a mother or father, you can bring up your children in the knowledge of God, working heartily as to the Lord. And at the end of the day, you can sleep and rest to the glory of God. What a great privilege. And as well as giving glory to God, it's also a great witness to others and an encouragement to our brothers and sisters in Christ. For example, in the workplace, we have a world where the common sentiment or feeling of individuals is one of burden, where we so often see people doing the bare minimum and no more, where there is complaint about the work we have to do and the conditions that we work under. 
And whilst it is sometimes right to ask for conditions to improve, any perceived injustice is no reason why we should not work to the best of our abilities and energies. To do otherwise, well, that would be dishonouring to God and betray our claim to be in Christ. When Jesus went to the cross to finish his work, that was the greatest injustice that man has ever, ever inflicted. Yet Jesus went willingly to die a gruesome, excruciating, degrading death for you and for me. So I would encourage you to fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, so that you will find joy in whatever task God has entrusted to you. Because we know that we deserve justice, but we receive grace. So go and serve your King. Amen.